The digestive system is a long tube that extends from our mouth to our anus. And that long tube is called the alimentary canal, also referred to as the gastrointestinal system, GI tract, or just simply gut. So its main job is that it's a continuous muscular tube that um, is going to transport what we digest, what we eat, the foodstuffs, break them into smaller fragments, and it consists of these organs, the mouth, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then finally anus. And the other part of the digestive system is made up of accessory digestive organs. These are organs that help break down the foodstuffs so that it can be absorbed into the body. And those include the teeth, the tongue, gallbladder, and digestive glands, such as salivary glands, liver, and the pancreas. So let's look at a diagram of the regions of the alimentary canal and the accessory digestive organs. So we can first see that the tube begins at the mouth. It then continues into the pharynx, the commonly referred to as the throat region, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, which has three different regions, and large intestine, and then finally the anus. And the accessory structures are going to include the salivary glands, and there's three different ones. They're called, um, they're named based on the region of the oral cavity, the tongue, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Now, even though the spleen is on here on this diagram, it's not a part of the digestive system. So the activities now that occur in the digestive tract first begin with ingestion, the process of eating, putting the food into our mouth. And the next is propulsion. And propulsion is going to include a couple different things. It includes swallowing and then peristalsis. And the word peristalsis means alternating waves of contraction and relaxation of a muscular tube. There's then mechanical breakdown, which includes chewing, mixing the food with saliva, a process called segmentation, digestion. Digestion is a it's a series of, of chemical reactions. These are catabolic steps that break larger molecules into smaller and smaller molecules, those of which are the chemical building blocks that can be absorbed into the tissue. So once these building blocks are produced, absorption can happen. And then finally, what is remaining is what is eliminated from our body with defecation in the form of feces. So we can see in this diagram, it shows that these processes happen at some different parts of the body. So ingestion happens at the beginning. Mechanical breakdown happens in several places, the mouth, stomach in the form of churning, and segmentation in the small intestine. Propulsion, swallowing in the oropharynx. Peristalsis happens several places, esophagus, stomach, and both intestines. Digestion occurs beginning at the stomach, absorption in the small intestine, and then finally defecation at the end of the digestive system. So let's take a look at the word peristalsis and segmentation and what they specifically mean. So the word peristalsis is referring to the food that's moving through the intestine and it's occurs in the alimentary canal organs. And again, it's the alternating contraction and relaxation of muscles. So we can see that food moves progressively from the mouth to the more distal end here. Whereas segmentation is, it occurs in non-adjacent segments of the GI tract and it's primarily mixing food and breaking it down mechanically. And so the main goal of segmentation is the mechanical digestion of food. 
So the anatomy of the digestive tract now, it, um, it's surrounded, it's in an area called the peritoneal cavity. And the peritoneal cavity is a fluid-filled space between the two peritoneums. Those peritoneal membranes are the visceral peritoneum, the membrane that is directly on the external surface of most digestive organs. We can see that shown in this diagram here. The parietal peritoneum is the one that's more superficial. It's the membrane that lines the body wall. And again, there's this fluid-filled space between them. So there's organs that are referred to as peritoneal organs. And there's also retroperitoneal organs. These would be ones that would be posterior to the peritoneal organs, such as the pancreas, the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum, and kidney and parts of large intestine. And just because kidney's here, that doesn't mean it's part of the GI tract. It's part of the urinary system. So the layers of the GI tract are these four. The deepest layer would be the mucosa, then the submucosa muscularis externa, and then serosa. So the innermost is the mucosa, and the outermost or more superficial would be the serosa. The function of the mucosa is that it lines the lumen, so it comes in contact with the food as it's being broken down. It secretes mucus, digestive enzymes, absorbs the end products of digestion, those building blocks, and it protects against infectious diseases. So that mucosa contains the epithelium, that would be the simple, the single layer of cells, specifically simple columnar epithelium, and cells that secrete mucus also in some of the tract. And then kind of the beginning and the end of the GI tract, the mouth esophagus, and also the anus, have a different type of epithelium. They have many layers of cells called stratified squamous epithelium. And so this diagram shows the layers and we can see the deepest layer is the mucosa with the epithelium, then the submucosa after that, the muscularis externa, which usually has two layers the circular and longitudinal layer. However, in the stomach where there's extra mixing, there is an additional layer called a circular layer. Then finally, the serosa. So the submucosa, it has several different types of tissue in it. It has um, blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, lymphoid follicles, as well as glands. The muscularis externa is a muscular layers and again has two main layers and an additional oblique layer in the stomach. And then finally, the outermost is the serosa layer.